Okay, how do we start this? Maybe I should introduce myself? Yeah. yeah. It's a fucking grab bag in there. Like, I'm gonna be surprised by a third of it. <laughs> hey there, I'm Kevin, the founder of Knifeware. I was a chef for a long, long time. And in 1999, I bought a Japanese kitchen knife. Actually, I bought this one, we'll talk about it in a bit. But I bought this knife and it blew my mind. It was sharper, it stayed sharp longer. I had no idea why it was so awesome. It started a bit of an excitement inside me, a little bit of passion, and I started buying, I basically I swapped over all my German knives for Japanese knives. God, I was living in London for about eight years, I guess. And then when I came back to Canada, there was no knives worth buying in my mind. I, I didn't really like anything that I could buy. So I started importing a few knives. My big plan, so this was 2007, and my big plan was to import some knives, sell them, to a couple of local chefs so that I could afford more knives. <laughs> 17 years later, here we are. We've opened the knife shops and uh, what, do we, what do we have now, guys? S seven, six, six shops? We got shops in Ottawa and Toronto is the newest, uh, Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, online. Let's look, let's look at the knives I've collected over the years. There's gonna be some from when I was working as a chef, some when I was working in London, and some from some embarrassingly cool stuff that I bought from garage sales just recently, or there's gonna be lots of gifts I've had from Japan, from different blacksmiths. And there's gonna be things in this mismatch of boxes that I have that I don't even know what they are probably. And I'd also like to warn you, and don't roast me too bad, I'm guessing some of the knives are probably rusty. <laughs> so let's dig in and see what we've got. First up, we have got this guy here, and he's in a case and he hangs on the wall in the Calgary shop uh, because this is the knife that started everything. It's a Hariyuki Yokuma. So it's got the Western handle and it's a 180 millimeter Santoku. And if you look closely at the knife, I don't know if you can zoom in there, but if you look closely along the edge, you can see where I've cracked some lobster and crab shells or where I've opened beer bottles. <laughs> like, as a chef, this is a tool, right? Like I know a lot of the knives we have are really precious and, and there are knives I have that are precious that I wouldn't do bad things to. But this was always my, uh, like a real workhorse knife for mine. You can see it's ugly. It's just been through a lot of years of kitchen abuse at, at my hands. But now it's safe behind glass and we hang it on the wall in the Calgary shop. So rest in peace, little buddy. All right, let's dig in here. What do we have? In these boxes, there's a lot of things that I have that are prototypes or things that we're working on. And here's the thing that we can't decide whether we like it or not. It's a honing rod with a different shape and there's different reasons for it, but I'm not convinced it's the answer. And here's one of the straws from my home. But I have to be honest, I have so many knives that in my kitchen, it's like, um, it's like a museum where they have only a third or an eighth of their collection on display at any time. So that's how my kitchen is. I've got four of these bigger magnets on the wall with whatever, 20, 30 knives up there. And I use those until one day I decide that too many of them are dollar on board. And then I dig through the boxes and I find 20 new knives that might inspire me. And I put them on the wall and I retire the other ones. Sometimes I sharpen them, sometimes they go back dull and then I'm just, and I'm embarrassed. Here, this is a fun one to start with. This is a Santoku I got years ago. A supplier gave me this knife. They made me a cute little I don't know if you can see, but it says, hello, Kevin on it. But there you go. It says, hello, Kevin on there in the Hello Kitty font with the Hello Kitty pink handle. So obviously a prized possession, but doesn't get used a whole bunch. Oyster shuckers. This is the one I've used forever. This is the new one I've been trying out from Toadfish. What a weird name. Here's the thing about oysters, guys. I can't eat raw ones anymore. They laid me low. They laid me out. <laughs> Here's something new that I got. It's from Macusta. And what I really like about it is that it's a tiny petty paring knife. So it's a, it's a 90 millimeter petty and it's Macusta VG10. It looks super cool. I love the weight and feel of these knives. It looks the biz, it has a great handle. I love the feel of it. And I'm not afraid to give that to friends when they come over. Oh, I've had coffee, Dave. Like, see my handshake in there? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not afraid to uh, let my, my, my friends use that knife. <laughs> okay, here's a fun one. There's a part one to this knife earlier. I mean, 
coming up. There's part one coming up. We'll do part two first. How's that sound? So this is from Masashi-san. He had never, he wasn't making Honosukis before, but here is his Honosuki. I don't know if it was the last, it was two times ago that he was in Canada visiting us. And I'd asked him if he could make some Honosukis. He's like, yeah, I never really made them before. So he said, what's the best one? So I gave him the Morataka Honosuki. We'll talk about that later because I think I've got one in here. I should, if I haven't misplaced it. The Morataka Honosuki I always thought was the best one. It's, uh, it's built with the mind that you're going to use it around chicken and bones and you're going to be a bit rough to it and the way the tip is made it's more it's more strong it's not it's, it's not going to be brittle like so many so many hanasukis out there and so many hanasukis they're not fat enough on the spine to give to make it a rugged knife but masashi has made his like this because he basically duplicated the morataka hanasuki okay i'll tell you the story now and we'll see if we get a morataka later how was it about eight years ago guys ten years ago that I, uh, so the way I used to order all the knives from the Mortak is, is I'd have a spreadsheet. They'd send me a spreadsheet and I would just like write the number <laughs> in each column of, of knives that I wanted. And it never said Hanasuki. So one day I just wrote in Hanasuki <laughs> and put 12. <laughs> just right, what's the worst that can happen? And uh, mortaka san he says, why, why do you sell so many Hanasukis? And I said, oh, well, it's a great knife and, and yours is tremendous. Like yours is probably the best one we sell. It's just built for the way I want to do chicken butchery. And he's like, oh yeah, is that a German or a European shaped knife? I said, no, no, I'm pretty sure it's a Japanese knife. And he goes, yeah, we don't, we've never made them. Now, if the Mortakas haven't made it, because <laughs> they've been making knives since 1293. They've got a, like the family's got a couple of years of, of uh, uh, experience making kitchen knives. So apparently he had never heard of it they don't really make that knife in, in Kyushu Island where they're from. So he looked on Amazon. He <laughs> searched on Amazon Hanasuki knife <laughs> and then found pictures of it and went, oh, I can make that. And he thought, well, they're going to be around bones. There's probably going to be like some twisting. I better make the bevel really shallow and the blade a bit fatter. So it's a really robust edge. And he looked at the tips and thought a lot of them look too fragile and they would break off. So he thought, oh, I'll just make the tip of mine stronger. And, uh, and I just, and I think it's such a great story because it, it tells the level of craftsmanship of Mortaka-san, where he can look at a picture on Amazon of a Hanasuki and then bust out the best Hanasuki that we carry. <laughs> and then Masashi said, oh, well, sure. What, which Hanasukis are really good? What do you like about them? So I showed him a few. I said, this is kind of the, what I think are the flaws of them. And just because it's my favorite doesn't mean it's the best one in the world, right? It just means it's the best one for me and the way I do things. And I know how I am with my Hanasuki, I'm a bit rough. So I wanted to build robust yet sharp, but robust. Anyway, so I gave him the Morataka one and he looked at it for a long time and said, okay. <laughs> and then sent us three versions of it that were all fantastic. We picked this shape as the one we wanted to go with. And boom, there we go. So. I believe that this and the Mortak are the best two Hanasukis we make or we, we sell. And one was based on Amazon photos and a whole ton of skill. And one was a copy of that knife. <laughs> oh, I know what that is. <laughs> so this is more or less a single bevel Nakiri. Look at the other side. So Suzuki-san is a, he's a sickle maker. If you see here, it's got this fatter piece along the edge. I don't know if you can see that, it kind of bends out. Anyway, that's to give it rigidity. So it's such a, it's such a thin knife. Like, look at that. It's such a thin knife um, because it's built like a sickle. <laughs> it's basically a sickle with a Japanese knife handle on it, which is awesome. I don't use it tons, but every time I use it, it's super fun. And I like to use it when people that know something about knives are around. So they go, what the hell's that? <laughs> because it's fun. All right, here is, oh, so this is some old stock of Takeda San and there's some rust on there. <laughs> I told you there would be. Takeda San used to make knives with Algami Super with carbon on the outside. He used to make them with Algami One with carbon. And he even did some Damascus knives, but I've never tricked him into selling me a Damascus knife. But this, we bought these years ago because he'd stopped using Algami One for years like he had stopped using it for five or six years but then one day I was at a shop we found a box 
full of these <laughs> knives. What is it called? New old stock? Is that what you guys call it? Um, so I just bought them all. And it was really interesting because the blades, you could tell how he changed his techniques over the years. He's always trying to, Takeda-san's always been trying to make a thinner and thinner and thinner knife. Because he had a, a chef friend once tell him that a thin knife cuts better. So Takeda said, okay, that will be my guiding principle. <laughs> He's basically trying to make like a slice of paper, like a piece of paper is what he wants to make. And if you look at his older knives like this one and another one that I'll have coming up here, you'll see that um, his knives have become thinner, even from 17 years ago when they were ridiculously thin at the time. Because now that he puts the uh, stainless steel on the outside of the Algami Super, it's made the knife a lot more rigid so he can just make them thinner. And he's always experimenting with the shapes of his hammer on the spring hammer and the shape of the anvil. And he's got like a really rounded anvil and a really rounded uh, hammer now. So when it hammers, it, it, he says it just gets thinner. And still though, he has that little heart on there. He always put the little heart on there saying that him and his dad put their hearts into what they did. So that's what that is. This one says Algami 1. And then the, of course he puts the size on there. He doesn't sell things by, this is a 240 millimeter or a 200 millimeter. He says it's small, medium, large, and extra large. Okay. All right, let's see what we've got here. I don't even know. It's my, one of my favorite kind of handles. It's magnolia or whole wood with a buffalo horn. Oh my God, it's rusted too. Shit. Okay, this here, this knife, look at this. I'm gonna pull it there first. You can see it. This is a Deba from Masashi-san because he, uh, he knows how much I love fishing. Him and I have been fishing out in the Pacific. We've been fishing in the rivers in, in Alberta. And he made this knife for filleting trout because he thinks I catch bigger trout than I catch. <laughs> I don't know the name of this shape and I should. This is one of my big shames, but there's a name for it. It's a really specific, it's a really specific Deba. I probably for eels, but he's built this one for me to use with trout. And what else is in this box with it? Oh, this knife. I have no idea what that is or where I got it or who made it, except I have it. I've used it many times. And it also has a bit of tarnish on it. I'm gonna have to fix these, all these knives. Problem is I've been collecting these for about 17 years. And some of them were prototypes. Some of them were knives from new makers that we actually didn't carry that knife from, or, or maybe we didn't end up carrying knives from them, or maybe they've moved to a different job or they're not doing it anymore. Who knows? Okay, this is an old Takeda box. Let's see what's in the old Takeda box. Oh, it looks like an old Takeda handle as well. It is. That's his little Kobanka. Again, made with number one blue steel and has a little heart on there. This is such a great knife because it's a little knife, but it's tall enough that I can use the cutting, use it on the cutting board and not wrap my knuckles on the board. This knife was super, super addictive when I first got it. I really liked it. And it reminds me that when I walked into this studio, I saw something on the wall here, guys. Like this knife. <laughs> and this knife. And this knife. <laughs> and this knife. These are all mine. Why are they in the studio? Because you left them here. You guys are jerks. Here's my first Takeda knife. So this knife. This is awesome. This I got about 16 years ago. And uh, it was featured as, they took a picture of me for the Globe and Mail magazine once. And a guy named Noah Fallis took the picture and he was like a rock and roll photographer. He photographed like Bowie and all kinds of crazy people. And he made me do my hair like super big and he backlit me and then he made me hold this thing in front of me like, like this or something. And it was like, a picture that I really liked because <laughs> I looked so cool. Anyway, there you go. It's that knife. And if you compare his knives from that long ago to the ones that are now, these ones feel almost heavy and like hammers compared to how thin his new knives are. And that's my knife and it's going home with me. You don't get it on the studio anymore. There you go. I have used this one in restaurants and I've done all kinds of terrible things to it. People sometimes tell me that his knives are fragile but 
I've cut the head off of fish. I've, I filleted salmon with this knife. I've done all kinds of dumb stuff. I did break the tip off the first day I had it though, because I used to test all the knives in some strange ways, because I knew people do weird stuff in their kitchen. So one of the tests would I go to my backyard and cut branches off of a tree. And then I would sometimes dig it in the ground and I broke the tip off because I hit a rock underground. So that's what I did day one I had that knife was I broke the tip off digging dandelions out of the backyard. But here's a funny story and this is gonna make you understand my level of, of stupid nerdness. When I first got this knife, I was so excited by it because it was such a bizarre knife, so thin, such a, like, such a crazy shape, almost like a canoe paddle. And uh, I kept it in the box and I kept it beside my bed. I slept with it for about a week beside my bed and I'd look at it before I go to bed and I looked at it when I woke up in the morning. <laughs> Here's a fun knife. This knife here, it says KK3 on it. And that is the third knife that I made with Takeda-san. So I made, I ended up making six knives with him. But this is the third one. I'm sure the other ones are in here. But I don't know why, but this was on the back wall. It's been in the studio. <laughs> It's been, it's been a set piece. Uh, it's a hammer. It is so heavy. It's, the forging's fine. The sharpening's great. I'm really proud of how I got the sharpening done on this. But it's so heavy, it's so fat. Like it should have been like much taller. I think maybe I made this in 2010. But I made, I made four knives of them that day and then I made two knives of them a few years later. And he was funny, he's like, you got better at this. I'm like, yeah, I've been making knives with you and Mortaka and uh, Masashi and Kurosaki and Anru and Aketa. I wanted to, not that I want to be a blacksmith, but I want to have a better understanding of what goes on. So there, cool knife. This is fun. This is not from Japan. This is a, this is a guy named Kensi out in Camrose. Is he in Camrose? So he's in rural Alberta. 17 year old, found some forging equipment in the barn and watched some videos on YouTube about how to make knives and started making knives. This is a wired one. Has anybody seen a folding Santoku? <laughs> so Saji made this for me because he knows I like fishing and camping and stuff. So he made this for me so I can have a nice knife when I'm hiking and it folds and it's a Santoku. This here, is a prototype. So back in, I don't know, about 2011 or 2012, Shibata-san and I started Masakagi Knives. Well, Shiba started Masakagi Knives and he was, he wanted my input about how to design the knives so uh, he could sell them outside of Japan to uh, foreigners. So this is one of the prototypes of the Yanagiba. So this is a single bevel Yanagiba. And this is, one of the prototypes we were working on and we more or less kept it exactly the same. So it was, but there were a couple of brothers that learned how to forge in Sakai and then went off and were doing this either in Miki or in Shikoku Island, I can't remember now. But anyway, they, they made what I thought were really great knives and they um, let us ask them to make it Kurochi. So leave the black on it because most or all until this point, I'd never seen any single bevel knives with Kurochi on them because a lot of chefs think it's dirty or it looks dirty, so they wouldn't want a knife that way. So that was like something I wanted to see because I thought Kurochi knives are really, really cool. Sasauka. So, right? Sasauka, thank you. Sasauka. So Sasauka-san made this. And that was the first, that was the first Kurochi single bevels I'd ever seen. So now when you guys are watching these videos, you can look up there and go, they've stolen Kevin's knives. <laughs> All right, what else is in here? These are fun. These are temple nails, and I made these. So I made these nails in Sanjo. There's a, there's a blacksmithing museum, and they have something like, they, I think they call it blacksmithing experience. So you can make nails. I didn't make this little one, but I found it there. Somebody had made it, and I grabbed it because it was cute, and I didn't think I could make something that little. And here is a Kiridashi. So this is a little um, utility knife. And I'm pretty sure it was a gift from Kazama-san, one of Masashi's buddies. Here's a funny knife and a, this is my mom's knife. So it's part of my mom's estate and I made sure I grabbed this and took it home with me. 
So this is the knife my mom used for years. And this here, in a beautiful, look at this beautiful sheath I've made for this. And I've, Coming soon to and I've glued com. it in. All right, well, this one here <laughs> is one of those knives that I have in case my friends are coming over to help me cook or something. I'm not afraid to put it in their hands. It's uh, stainless steel, robust enough to put up with a bit of abuse and looks super awesome. And I like to feel these handles. Actually, I think this is the best knife that uh, Miyabi makes. I really like them. I've been known to use it more than you think, because I know that certain staff members like Nolan think that I just use only the, like, <laughs> Fujiwara Denkas and <laughs> Kegarasan knives and, you know, things, things made by, uh, you know, Mujin or something like, he thinks that everything I use is like the super, super high end stuff, but I have lots of knives. The problem is I just, I just really like knives. So these are, and I can't tell you who made these, but these are gardening shears. And these have been used a lot in my little garden. Um, again, I don't know who made them. Masashi gave them to me. Masashi-san really likes the guy that makes these. And because of that, I think they're probably the best because Masashi-san thinks they're the best. So they have to be. And here is, oh look, it's like a little tree ornament thing, and it's a Christmas present from Fujiwara-san. Oh, that's right. I have to write him a quick letter. So Fujiwara-san had a big party last year that Owen and I went to to celebrate his 150th anniversary of his company. And then for Christmas, he sent me this little guy and a beautiful little card. So that's nice. Oh, here's something fun. <clears throat> this again, is like a prototype or something we're working on, but it didn't go anywhere. So here it is. It's a just a Tojo DP Damascus blade with this really, really unusual handle. I don't know if you can see, but there's all this texture and these raised rivets. It's just a handle they were trying out that, uh, that uh, as far as I can tell, absolutely nobody liked. So it never went anywhere. This is fun. I get to go through all this. <gasps> hey, look at this. This is something we did. This was something we did with Takai Takayuki. Sakai Takayuki. They made us, uh, I believe they call these knives Grand Chef. So these are the Grand Chef knives. We, they put our little old logo on it and they made these like wicked, wicked thin, super light knives. And, uh, and then we got these uh, handles that were painted by a, by a guy that paints motorcycles. <laughs> so Shibata-san helped us get this. And I really liked these knives. They're super light. I liked the handle, everything. And uh, Naoto and I were the only ones that liked them. <laughs> I own one. And Nathan's got one too. It's one of those things where Naoto and I thought, this is a winner. Like this, how everybody in the world is gonna love this knife. This is the best knife ever. And we were wrong. We were wrong. I still love mine though, it's great. You'll see this knife a few times through this collection in different sizes. <laughs> and sometimes they say Susan on them and sometimes it'll say Takai Sak Sakai Takayuki. This here is a knife that I bought when I was with the Moritakas last time. This is a Soba Kiri. So this knife, and I've never used it, but it's, this knife was the knife that was supposed to inspire me to make soba at home. And then I could cut the noodles with this knife. And that's as far as it got. So here's a Manaka box, but there's no Manaka knives in here so far as I can tell. This is the first SG2 Damascus knife he made, or at least in the first batch. So when I saw these the first time in Japan, I was like, okay, I need these. Can I have that one? He's like, yeah, sure. He's like, which handle do you want? And I went, I've got a handle in my backpack that I got from Yamakin. <laughs> so we put the handle on at his shop. Fun, super fun. I love this knife. Super light, super light, looks beautiful and keeps an edge like ridiculously long. And it's from Kato-san, he's such a good guy. Okay, can we talk about Kegura-san for a bit? In fact, I got two axes over there. Can you grab those two axes? Break. We'll grab break. Maybe we just need a Kegura break here. Kegura-san is mostly retired now. If you look in the book we did, the 
Knife Nerd's Guide to Japanese Kitchen Knives, the whole section about Damascus steel is from Kagura-san. He was doing something in Tosa that nobody else was doing. He's now retired. He never had, he didn't have apprentices. He didn't have employees. And this technique though was very popular in the, the Shikoku Island area. As far as I know, he was the last one doing it. Nobody else is anymore. He was buying um, scrap metal from different areas. So from the highway patrolling, from the highway fixing. So he was buying rakes and shovels and hose. He was buying old farm equipment and uh, he's got a ship wrecking yard near him. So he buys pieces of ship's hull. They were about that big and about that fat and they're incredibly heavy, this lump of steel. And what he does is he cuts these steel into small pieces and then makes a little sandwich of seven tall where he, the day I was there, it was a piece of shovel and then ship, shovel, ship, shovel, ship, shovel, ship. So he makes a little stack of seven of those, forge welds them together and stretches it out and gives it a, a Z fold or a three fold. Yeah, it gives it a fold that's like a letter Z. And then he makes three stacks like that and then puts those three stacks together and again, stretches them out and gives them the Z fold again, puts them together. And that's what he starts making the knives out of. And that's the outside cladding for the knife. And he puts Agami one in the center. And that technique, I don't know if you can see it really well here, but the pattern of Damascus he gets is super tight and it looks like little hairs. And the greatest thing about using two different steels when he does it is they oxidize at two different rates and they oxidize differently. So the pattern, when you buy the knife, when you first have the knife, the pattern is almost invisible. And then as you use it, the pattern comes out as, as, the, as the two knives or the two steels oxidize differently. And I love his knives. I love how they work. I love how ridiculously sharp they are. I love how they stay sharp. I love that this line here, you can see the line where he grinds, where the bevel is, but you can't feel it with your finger. And I asked him about that. And the first time I met him, I said, why can I see that line, but I can't feel it. And his answer was the best. He said, cause I'm very good at grinding knives. <laughs> and I can't argue with that. And that was about the time the earthquake hit.